This is it. Kobolds, my favorite race to play. I've been playing Kobolds at countless tables weekly for two years straight. This is no joke. Through this experience, I've learned a lot of things people don't really think or know about. I've become an expert in kobold mechanics. I've written a guide that's 24 pages about kobold numbers to build up my confidence to become a proper DM. And let me tell you, the game feels different. The mechanics can really fight you. And on top of that, you're playing a monstrous race. So what you get out of both of these things is a new experience you've never had before in 5th edition. So in today's video, we think like kobolds, we play like kobolds, we act like kobolds, we optimize like kobolds, we math like kobolds, we become kobolds. Welcome to Pack Tactics, where everyone has advantage. A little story for you. I don't usually tell stories, but I think I will this one time. Back when I made my first kobold, what intrigued me was what I mentioned in the beginning. The mechanics really fight you, and you're playing a monstrous race. You are playing what normal people in-game view for the most part, a small cave lizard. You're basically a caveman. On top of that, these kobolds breed like bunnies. So there's tons of them in a singular tribe. And these kobolds go mine and raid for supplies. They are considered vermin in society. That to me is interesting. One time I struggled to buy some wine from the local inn. They grabbed my tail and threw me out. They called me pest for what I am. So I decided to break the law. I snuck in and stole some wine for myself. That was fun. Not only that, as the game continued, I proved the whole country wrong and became their hero. Bards would sing about my deeds. A small caveman lizard who shot down a dragon from the sky. That's fun. For those who worship Lord of the Rings, it's a similar experience I want to have in D&D. Doing the right thing may have for selfish reasons or for others like family, or the party, or even greater things even. When all odds are against me, no turning back, ride or die. Prove the impossible is possible. A two to three foot tall cobalt standing against the greatest of evil the world has to offer and destroying it. A true underdog story and a hell of a legend. Now. Let's descend into some dungeons and kill some dragons. Let's talk mechanics. At the time when I made my first kobold, the internet really ranked kobold slow. Worst race in the game, they said. When I jumped into it, I thought the same too, but the underdog potential intrigued me. So I went for it and optimized. Oh boy. I found out they were very wrong. Ability score increase, your dexterity score increased by two. In the past, kobolds also got a minus two to strength, and people view that as really bad. In reality, it didn't affect much. Strength is a dump stat for a kobold player anyways. The worst I got out of having six strength is carry weight being a small problem, and that one time and only time I got trampled unconscious by eight horses. I surprisingly don't see a lot of strength saves in practice. Then on October 2nd, 2020, Kobold's strength penalty was removed from the game. How much did that really change? Optimally, Paladin multiclassing became a big deal for Kobolds. Crit fishing is a serious business. 9.75% increase in chance. November 17th, 2020, Tashis came out. That plus two ability score can go anywhere. That made my guide somewhat outdated, but it's still very much relevant to the discussion. I won't update the old guide, it's simply too much work. 
you can view this video as a version 1.1. Size, 2 to 3 foot tall and weigh as much as a baby pretty much. Kobolds are the smallest race in the game. You can use that to your advantage, of course. You're probably getting a million ideas now, but let me point one out that's out there. Minor Illusion, for example, can cover your whole body while standing, creating a 5 foot tall box. That's really good stealth if you need it. Grovel, cower, beg, as an action until the end of your next turn, your allies gain advantage on attack rolls against enemies within 10 feet of you that you can see. Once you use this trait, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. It's good for low levels. In use it's rare, but if you have lots of allies nearby, this is incredible. If your table has flanking rules, then this feature becomes very hard to use. The standout thing to point out here is this combos well with conjure animals. For example, giving all the animals advantage can be devastating. Action economy plus advantage is king. Now let's talk pack tactics. This is my drug. You have advantage on attack rolls against a creature if at least one of your allies is within 5 feet of the creature. Godlike, this is my favorite feature in the whole game. It's a gateway to infinite advantage if you play your cards right. There's a reason why I wrote 27 pages, and it's mostly about this. This is basically like flanking, but better. This works with ranged attacks and ranged spell attacks too. It's advantage to every single attack you make. It's astonishing. The setup is so simple, and it triggers as often as sneak attack, so there's a baked-in rogue inside the race itself. What does this mean mathematically? Let's assume point by real quick. The kobold has 16 dexterity and is level 1. Against a creature that has 14 AC, it's a 60% chance of hitting normally, and with advantage, it's 84%. How am I getting these values for advantage? I square the chance to miss. So 60%, we square the miss. 0.40 times 0.40 is 16. 100 minus 16 is 84. So 84%. Anyways, we can easily boost these percentages up as we pick class features like archery at level 1. Then your chance to hit is 70%, and with advantage, it's 91%. These are crazy numbers. You hit all the time. The balance part of this feature is reliant on the front liners like marshals and gishes. And in a game of full casters, it might be difficult to achieve pack tactics consistently. That's something to consider as well. Those marshals and gishes are your heroes. They make you perform better. You need them. I highly recommend becoming their best friends. Samwise levels of friendship. Now, let's talk about the other interesting feature that keeps pack tactics more balanced. Sunlight sensitivity. You have disadvantage on attack rolls and on perception checks that rely on sight when you, the target of your attack, or whatever you're trying to perceive is in direct sunlight. That's right, the sun is your ultimate enemy. This is the mechanic that fights you. That's a rare feature to have in 5th edition. If you play in a game where the sun doesn't exist, then this feature obviously doesn't affect you. Some of you might argue this is bad game design. For a drow, I would agree. For a kobold, I would not. Pack tactics can still activate, and then you have a normal roll again. Advantage and disadvantage cancel each other out. Now, the important word here is the direct, indirect sunlight. It's not defined by the rules, though. So we have to use the English language to define direct sunlight. But really, in the end, it is DM interp of what it means. I'll talk more about it as we go. So what's interesting about this feature is really the environment, the terrain, and the maps presented by the DM, or the artist. The maps might have cast shadows from trees, walls, pillars, and roofs, and what have you. You as a kobold are using these shadows the artist or the DM have created to your advantage. 
If both the enemy and you are in these shadows away from direct sunlight, you can potentially get straight advantage again. What would normally just be decorations to detail environment is now part of gameplay. On top of terrain, the gameplay turns more complex unintentionally. The kobold player will ask frequently, what is the weather like to the DM? When is the last time you've asked your DM what the weather is like? Maybe it's frequent in your RP game, but this is also a mechanical gameplay to the kobold. The kobold player cheers when it's cloudy, bad, rainy weather, and is angry when it's a clear and sunny day. That also has RP value, for majority of other races enjoy the sun while the kobold is grumpy. When I talk about cloudy and bad weather, I mean weather that blocks out direct sunlight. Look at this. Would you say this is direct sunlight? It's clearly daytime, but there's no sun. It's just clouds up in the sky. Believe it or not, this is actually theoretical optimization, which is baffling to me. There are no rules about the clouds or rain or anything like that. Only winds and lighting. So by the rules, bad weather doesn't do anything. So the DM can rule that you're still in direct sunlight, even with thick clouds blocking the sun. This is a stupid thing the DM can rule. He can continue and also claim that stars in the night sky also count as direct sunlight. It's absurd. If you have a DM like that, you should probably leave. Quick math for what that disadvantage means for the kobold. Let's go back to that 60%. To find out disadvantage is you square the chance to hit. 0 0.60 times 0.60 is 36% chance of hitting. That's incredibly bad, so you might as well just dodge at that point, if you can't do anything else. Optimization-wise against the sunlight, to this day people recommend Kobold Rogues. If it's a Kobold build, chances are high it's a rogue, and these builds do next to nothing to find ways to bypass sunlight sensitivity. The secret to Kobolds have always been the gish for three things. I've said this for years. 1. If you're in direct sunlight and have disadvantage to attacks no matter what you do that turn, you can cast spells or cantrips instead. That can be AoE, a buff, saving throws, whatever. That's more optimal than attacking. 2. Summon creatures of some kind. That can even be a fine familiar, for example. So long as the familiar is within 5 feet of the enemy, pack tactics will activate. The familiar might die, but oh well. If an enemy is spending their actions on the familiar, that's a win in my book. Sure, you lose some money, but oh well. 3. Fog Cloud. If you really want to do attacks, you can cast Fog Cloud above you and your enemies to block out direct sunlight. From it, you can get advantage again. That's a little bit of a setup for its an action cast. But if you do fantastic damage through your build, then it's absolutely worth it. If you're playing with another Cobalt player, then Fog Cloud is absolutely mandatory. You do so much for them by giving them, and even you, infinite advantage. Yes, you could cast Fog Cloud above you. Is sunlight sensitivity a problem for majority of encounters? I would say no, because a lot of the gameplay takes place inside. Dungeons and Dragons has dungeons in the name, so it's a given. And not only that, you also fight sometimes at night, so there's that. There is a way to rid sunlight sensitivity, and it's Knave's Eye Patch. I've never had a DM hand this out, and I don't think they would dare give it to me. It's basically a legendary item for a kobold player. Back to pack tactics. It's so strong that some DMs that I've played with have nerfed it on the spot. Some have nerfed it all the way to the ground. I've come to the conclusion it's better than Elven Accuracy due to how easy it is to trigger constantly. Elven Accuracy requires more setup. Still though, getting your pack tactics nerfed isn't good. I've been upset about it in the past. It's a massive highlight to the Kobold and it's incredibly fun to have and the reason why is because of this mechanical battle with sunlight sensitivity. I don't know if I'm the only person who feels this way, for when I read other Kobold players, they're brewing for new type of Kobold features, 
yet I want to continue to play vanilla. It baffles me to why. Last thing to mention about sunlight sensitivity, a simple balance thing everyone, including myself, forgets. Disadvantage to perception checks when creatures or you are in direct sunlight. Perception checks are the most important checks in the game. Some of these failed perception checks can potentially knock you out or kill you. You don't want enemies to ever have surprise round. This is the biggest weakness to the Cobalt, so having proficiency in perception checks is mandatory. You can say that about every character, but well, anyways, if you know your DM throws these surprise rounds from time to time, alert feet is a godsend. Whew, that was quite a lot about sunlight sensitivity, and I feel like I've barely scraped the surface. It's an interesting feature to talk about in detail. I've sat on it for a long time. Moving on, there's dark vision, 60 foot range. Keep in mind with dark vision, the darkness turns to dim light, so that means it's lightly obscured. So disadvantage to perception checks, again. Apparently, all the tables I've played in, and trust me, that's a lot of tables, have all done the rules for dark vision wrong, including myself. You need to think like a cobalt. It's optimal to always travel in bad or cloudy weather, so you always have that pack tactics active and in full power. If you can't, then option number two is wait till nighttime and travel then. Convincing your party to travel at night can be hard, especially if someone doesn't have dark vision. Then I recommend buying bullseye lanterns for everyone. You should also walk around with it at night. You need those straight rolls for perception checks, and that includes everyone else. We're near the end now. We move on to classes quickly. I do recommend looking into my old guide for the math, really. They are quite impressive to this day. A reminder, Tash has made every class relevant to the Cobalt now. When I wrote this guide, I only wrote about the best classes and subclasses for it. All of them ended up being either Gishes or full casters. To this day, I still say that's the case. I optimized them all for damage, and those are the numbers I got. Keep in mind, all of this is within the context of the Kobold having plus 2 dex, minus 2 strength, point by, and always having pack tactics active. Wild Mount's content wasn't a thing at the time when I wrote this. What do I think about the guide now? I still use it for DMing. If a player is outperforming optimized cobalt damage with advantage, for example, then I know something's wrong and I should hold back on magic items. If it's a result from Tasha's power creep alone, then I let it be, but still hold back on magic items. Optimization-wise, my mind has changed here and there, especially for Gish's. What I mean by that is I would optimize them differently from what I say in the guide. Like, for example, Gloomstalker. I would grab Sharpshooter instead of Crossbow Expert. I don't know what I was thinking. Everything I say about Paladins is now super out of date, so I advise ignoring that part. What I say about Warlocks and Druids is 100% correct, and I'm quite proud of that part. The link to the guide is down below. That's it. I hope to see more Kobold players on the rise. I rank them in the A- race. They're fantastic. I love them. If you want a different type of gameplay, Kobold is it. Thank you for watching. Subscribe.